Good morning and welcome to Over the Target. I'm Lee Smith. Thank you for joining us this morning. We have a really fantastically interesting show uh, with a gentleman named Floyd Brown. Many of you uh, will be aware of his work over the years, famous political activist, also commentator, media personality, and author. And we're here today, among other reasons, to speak with Floyd about his new book, Counterpunch. Floyd, welcome and thank you so much for being on Over the Target today. Lee, it's great to be with you. Well, look, I, I, I want reading the book. You know, I'm, 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 I'm. I was really caught by, um, by how you begin your introduction. There's a large meeting in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and it's not intended to be a revival meeting, but it certainly feels like one because what you describe is, um, what you describe as people at an event. They have a sense that they're divided, that they've been uh, they've been hurt by something, and they find a lot of healing speaking with each other and being there with each other. So if you can just talk a little bit about that yeah. meeting. Um, no, that was a, it was it, yeah, it was a really important meeting in my own life and part of my healing post COVID, which is something I think every American needs. I mean, we were locked down and basically made prisoners in our own houses for, uh, you know, almost two years. And it was, uh, you know, two weeks to slow the spread became two years to uh, change our lives. And, uh, you know, when you when you were first coming out of COVID, traveling was such a, a kind of an eerie feeling. I remember when I went to that meeting in Tulsa, there weren't a lot of meetings happening and, uh, you know, you go to the airport and, uh, you know, I live in Phoenix, so I was at Sky Harbor Airport, which is usually just such a bustling place. And thankfully, it's bustling again. But back then, it was it was eerily silent. And I got on a plane that was, you know, half full and, uh, I, and it was just so dystopian. I remember flying into Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'd been invited to this conference to speak uh, by a business consultant. The business consultant was upset because as a business consultant, most of his customers had been shut down. And so, you know, he was trying to figure out a way to get his customers moving. So he, he called it the Great Reopening Conference. And uh, so we went there and, uh, you know, the hotel was dead. It was just I had trouble finding a rental car because if you remember during COVID, the rental car companies sold their entire fleet yeah, and there were no cars to rent. And yeah. so it was just, it was so strange, but um, uh, you know, we got into this meeting and it was actually held in a church because there wasn't a hotel that was open in Tulsa mm -hmm. that would allow them to meet in the hotel. So we met in this church and it was, it was amazing I walked into that church. There was between four and 5,000 people there. And it was so healing because the masks came down mm. and we started hugging. We reconnected with each other. Mm. There was actually, you know, physical contact. And then, as I say um, in my book, the, the Holy Spirit showed up. We felt a tremendous uh sense of renewal and uh, people reconnected with their own humanity and reconnected with God. Because if you'll remember, one of the things that the elites really tried to do during COVID was end church. They wanted you to stop going to church. And if you did go to church, they said, hey, you can't sing a song. And it was it was just it was wonderful. And my, and my wife and I, we both talk about it to this day. Hmm. And part of why I started there was because uh Clay Clark, the business consultant that organizes conference, I started to organize more conferences. And I traveled, I, you know, I think he's held 18 conferences and I've spoken between at between 10 and 12 of them. And every time I go to one of these conferences, people would come up to me and they would say, hey, Floyd, what can we do? How can we help reclaim America? How can we get back to, uh, you know, controlling our lives again? And so that's really what was my motivation in writing this book, Counterpunch, it's to, you know, talk about ways that average Americans can regain their community and mm. regain their neighborhoods and regain that sense of uh, togetherness that uh, has made America so great. You know, we, we're all, you know, the sons and daughters of immigrants, 
but we came here and we became a great melting pot of people that have a shared purpose. That's what made America special. We, we had a shared freedom. We had a shared purpose. We could come from anywhere on the globe, but we had a set of beliefs that were laid down by our founders that, that united us all. And I think that still exists. And so that's one of the things about my book that I really try to, to focus on is, is bringing that back. So well, it, it's, it's called Counterpunch. Yeah, there we have it. Let me just read off the subtitle quickly. An unlikely alliance of Americans fighting back for freedom. Um, one of the things that's so moving about the Tulsa meeting and your book generally is because, look, I mean, I have to say I, I, I'm, I'm despondent sometimes myself. We look around and we see all sorts of divisions, right? We see divisions inside communities themselves at different times, not just uh, red states and blue states, but sometimes there are communities themselves that are divided. And you say, no, this div these divisions have been forced on us and it's not that difficult to get it back together. So first I want to ask, what is that unlikely alliance? Then I want to ask, how, how do we solidify <laughs> that alliance? Okay, well, first let me talk about why we're so divided. Okay. We have to understand that Saul Alinsky was the number one strategist and tactician for the left, really since uh, the late 1970s. And if you read Rules for Radicals, which is something I encourage, you know, uh, every American to do because it helps you understand our current politics. Alinsky was the great divider. In fact, he actually... Uh, believe it or not, he uh, dedicates his book to Lucifer, who, you know, he calls one of the great protesters of history. And uh, uh, so uh, Alinsky developed this whole system by which the left divides everyone. And, you you know, uh, one of one of the rules that he teaches, for example, is put a face to the enemy. That's why the left focuses so much time and energy on Donald Trump. I mean, uh, you, you know, uh, conservatives don't talk about Donald Trump half as much as liberals do. I mean, they are obsessive about it, but that's all straight out of Alinsky's book mm. and, um, and, and, and creating division, trying to hold people to unrealistic standards. All of these are tools that Alinsky developed, and now it's become embedded into the left. And really, they're, they're right out of Marxism. Uh, you know, a good place to begin to understand this is to just go and read the Communist Manifesto, because that's where the left is getting its political inspiration. And, and even if you go back to the, the manifesto, which was, you know, written, you know, over a century ago, uh, you know, one of the things they want to tear down is the family, because if they tear down the family, then they can use government to replace the family. So there's so much focus on division, dividing people, tearing people apart, tearing communities apart. <clears throat> now, what made America special was we always had unbelievable community um, togetherness. Now, when I was growing up, you know, we had the Lions Club, we had the Kiwanis Club, we had the Rotary Club, we had, you know, all of these different uh, organizations right in my little hometown that, that worked to better the community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people felt that they needed to be involved in the community. And people felt that s sacrifice to help others was a good thing. You know, the, the, Current polling shows that that Americans have kind of lost that they don't they don't think it's significant to sacrifice for other people. So so you 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 had all these community organizations. A lot of those organizations had already been falling back, but COVID was like the final nail in the coffin that killed so many of these local groups. And so as uh, as as what, I, what I'm encouraging people to do, and really what I talk about in my book, is people underestimate the power that they have to impact right around them. And, and you know, you may not know your neighbors anymore. That's an interesting thing. People have, have you know, have quit 
have quit, uh, you know, being as active in their neighborhoods. So I, I encourage people, number one, first get to know your neighbors, uh, you know, take them to coffee, go, you know, go and, 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 and learn about them. You're going to find neighbors who think and believe like you and want to protect and defend these American ideals and then work together with them inside the community to really impact your neighborhood, your town hall and all of what's around you. And that's where you have the maximum power. That's where you have the maximum influence. And so that's where I tell people to really work hard. Uh, Floyd, this is an excellent point because you spoke before about how during COVID they wanted to take um, worship away from people, right? And this is, of course, one of the places where people go to be with their neighbors. People go to worship God and they go to pray. But so many other things were shut down as well, right? I, I, I mean, yeah. youth, youth sports, right? The people who who coach Little League or or soccer or who take their kids to do these things or, you know, the, the, amount, the few bowling leagues that are still around. But all these different organizations where communities gather and exchange ideas and also I mean, obviously, one of the purposes was that they didn't want people getting together so that uh, people would confide in each other saying, I, th I actually think this COVID thing is not what they're telling us. I think there's a lot of things they're not telling us the truth about. So they've taken they, they took that away from us. Do you see evidence right now that these that these structures, some of them formal, like the Lions Club, um, like Little League Baseball, do you see these things are being uh, not rebuilt, but being restored, that people are going yeah, they back are. They're going back to these organizations now? They are being restored, and it, it's part of this renewal process. And, you know, I actually have been speaking at a lot of these clubs, and they are coming back. Just got back from Bakersfield, California, where I met with uh, uh, one of the, the leaders of the Rotary there. And so, you, you know, you're, you're seeing this uh, renewal and I think it's really important. People are starting to go back to church, but still, uh, you know, it's not as in great of numbers as it was before COVID. There's still a lot of people that are isolated. And one of the things that I find really interesting is there's, uh, you, you know, we've learned so much about COVID in these intervening years. And what we realize is that they sold us a bill of goods that it was going to, you know, early on that it was going to kill everybody. And um, they, uh, they, they hyped this thing so much that uh, yes, people are distrustful of government. People don't, you know, they don't even trust the medical establishment anymore. I talk to people that say, Hey, you know, I go to the doctor and uh, I, I just can't trust him like I used to. And uh, uh, so there's there is um, a sense that um, we, you know, the narratives are changing and what were considered conspiracy theories at the beginning of COVID, right when they were shutting everything down now, I think, have been fully exposed. And, and so part of what I talk about is the impact on normal people. Hmm. You know, when you look at just the COVID response. The COVID response, I knew as early as April that um, uh, ivermectin worked. I actually was on a conference call with a, uh, a missionary doctor in the Dominican Republic who was telling us, hey, you know, we've been using ivermectin against COVID down here in the Dominican Republic. I haven't lost one person. And uh, then we learned that budesidine, even in cases where COVID attacked the lungs, uh, and you were in really tough shape, budesidine uh, really helped. So there were therapeutics that were suppressed by government policy that actually worked. And then, um, you know, they told us, you know, you have to have the vaccine. You can't come out of your house until you've had the vaccine. You can't travel till you've had the vaccine. You can't go back to work till you've had the vaccine. It was a policy that was predicated on making people rich. There were over 40 new billionaires that were minted because of COVID policy. And this is something I talk about extensively in the mm -hmm. book. And that is, is that our government has been captured by a group of elites and these elites run policy for their own 
benefit for their own financial gain and their own financial benefit. And, you know, I would I would say right now the CDC is basically a, a biotech company because of all of the patents that they control that uh, are a result of government research and, and they're getting huge funds from it. So that's distorting policy. It's distorting public health. And we've got to get back to a position where we actually focus on science uh, in, in terms of that kind of policy. But uh, we, we also have to recapture our government from these elites that have spent, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars on lobbyists and frankly have captured the government for their policies, you know, uh, over and over. If you look, why, why is the border open, for example? Well, you have a... a but hold on, you, let, let me, let's pick it up right this after the break. Uh, it's no conspiracy theory. It is no conspiracy theory that the government shut down this country, hurt the economy, hurt Americans, divided us. Floyd's book, Counterpunch, has the answer for how to reunite us, how to restore the country. And we're going to pick it right back up with Floyd after a quick break. If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, please make the jump. We're going to Epoch TV exclusively. Make the jump with us. You're watching on Facebook or YouTube. We'll be back in less than a minute. Make sure to make the jump. See you in a sec. For at least a decade, it's been building that the DEI bureaucracies have been in place. The incorporation of that ideology um, throughout academia, throughout education, and now even into corporations and government. Well, wait, that's... That's illegal. It's unconstitutional. Very aggressive programs to promote what they say is anti-racism, which is that you judge people based on their identity group. They are so deeply embedded in this sort of racial gerrymandering. And the people who are pushing the DEI stuff know that and they exploit it because they know the, the fear that people have. 